Hello there, thank you for joining us. I'm James Ujo, I'm the founder of the Defund the BBC campaign, which I, today I am joined by a very special guest. This is the founder of the Vote Leave campaign. He is the first elected UKIP Member of Parliament and he is now a very popular author in the political sphere. Douglas Carswell, how are you Douglas? James, hi, uh, well done to you for this initiative. I think it's incredibly important and incredibly timely and I wish you every success. Let's defund the BBC. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to talk to you about an interview you did with The Sun a few months ago in January, where you mentioned uh, the fact that in your 12 years of experience with the BBC, that they would never let you talk. So I wanted to pick up on this. Should a public broadcaster be acting like this? Because obviously some people say that politicians must be held to account by journalism. And what do you think the BBC could be doing better? Of course, politicians need to be held to account by journalists and our public broadcaster, the BBC, has a special duty to hold their feet to the fire, so to speak. The problem is that the BBC often actually lets policymakers off the hook because they, they focus on gotcha trivia, on nonsensical issues, and it allows the really important things that they ought to be asking politicians never to be put to politicians. I'll give you an example. We've just had a, a shutdown of society and the economy. Because of the, the coronavirus, we've had to, in effect, close every school, stop people from going to work, consign people to virtual house arrest. Far from asking the really tough, difficult questions that we should have been asking the policymakers who made those choices for us, the BBC has been focused on largely irrelevant issues. At the time, we should have been asking whether or not we were taking care of care homes to stop the spread of the virus through the care home system. The BBC was obsessing about people sunbathing in public parks. At a time when we should have been asking really tough questions about whether the government was wise to extend the furlough system for another three months, they were worrying about Dominic Cummings' childcare arrangements. This isn't serious journalism. It's not doing the job of informing us, the public, and holding the policymakers to account. But it's, it's not just current affairs that I think the BBC does so badly. They often report the news, not on the basis of what is actually happening, but on the basis of a narrative that they have. And they then set out to pick facts to fit the narrative. Now, this isn't actual journalism at all. It's, it's, it's fiction writing. It's, it's fraudcasting, not broadcasting. It's not informing the license fee pair of what's happening out there in the world. But you know, my objections to the BBC aren't really just about the BBC's current affairs and news coverage. If it was only that, I could live with it. But what I find so obnoxious is the way that the BBC, which I have no choice but to pay for, uses its privileged position to promote an obnoxious, toxic agenda that is dividing our country and dividing society. I, I couldn't agree more, Douglas, really. Um, so I recently read your book, Rebel, How to Overthrow an Emerging Oligarchy. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, I wanted to talk to you about how you discussed the overhauling of certain cabals. You refer to them as cartels. So you talked about spads, parliamentary staffers, I think um, civil servants as well. Now, I wanted to talk to you. Do you think the BBC falls under this category? Absolutely. The BBC is a brilliant example of a monstrous cartel. Every single one of us, by law, has to give £157 in the licence fee to the BBC. All that money together creates a vast pile of cash, £3.7 billion. That's an enormous amount of money. Now, to put that in context, when we subscribe to Spotify, we pay only about half that amount. And I, I personally find there's a lot more that I want to watch. Sorry, not Spotify, Netflix. When we, when we, when we subscribe to Netflix, we, we're paying about half that amount. I personally find there's a lot more on Netflix that I want to watch than the BBC ever manages to produce. So what do they do with that money? Well, a lot of what they do with that money is to give their management very large paychecks. There are lots and lots of people at the BBC who are pretty mediocre individuals, pretty bad at doing pretty dead-end jobs, who get paid vastly more than anyone in Downing Street's ever been paid. But even worse than that, they have a commissioning system 
where unlike any other television commissioning system around the world, in America, for example, if you get commissioned by a studio to, to, to make a program, they go through your accounts in great detail, making sure that they're getting value for money. The BBC actually uses a crony system where they award fat contracts to mates and to friends. And often the amount of money that is awarded to those who produce the programmes for the BBC is way in excess of what it needs to be. This allows for very fat margins. And this answers the curious question as to why it is so many former BBC producers who now run independent television companies are now extremely wealthy. Like all cartels, they feather their own nest with it. I don't object to people getting rich. I do object to them getting rich for doing a mediocre job with my money. Um, yeah, it, it, it does seem that way. Um, I remember you also said, um, I think it was, politics would be a lot better without the commentariat of the BBC, and without it, you're going to see wonderful things. So could you expand on that comment, and what direction do you think things will go if the BBC scraps the licence fee? Well, I, I think there's a lot of really good comment out there, um, but it's generally written comment, written by journalists working for newspapers or online publications for a subscription audience. I think there's some pretty good essays in journalism written by, for example, The Times. Um, the New Statesman, not everyone who works The New Statesman I particularly agree with, but there have been some really good essays produced by The New Statesman. Um, the Guardian is worth looking at. I don't always agree with it, but they produce good stuff. And The Spectator, I think, has, has come on. Um, it, it's done wonders. It's one of the oldest uh, magazines in, in, in the English speaking world and yet it's now I think probably one of the best. Um, it's good journalism. The problem with broadcast journalism is that it doesn't actually have to appeal to a subscriber base. Instead what it does is fulfill a, a mandate usually pretty sloppily. We saw this on, on Newsnight the other night when uh, some basic elementary broadcast guidelines that the BBC should stick to to ensure impartiality and objectivity were cast aside so we could be subjected to Emily Makeless's adolescent opinions and takes on things. The problem is that this, this mindset of mediocre pedestrian analysis of current affairs permeates pretty much every aspect of the BBC, BBC's broadcast outward. So yeah, it's impossible, I think, now to listen to Radio 4's Today programme and to be informed about what's happening in the world. Instead, you, you hear what the producer of that show would like to be happening in the world. It, it's very difficult, I think, to, to be informed and to get an incisive, insightful take on current affairs. Look, Britain's a pretty small part of the world geographically, although I happen to think we're pretty important in, in many cultural and economic ways. But there's a big, big world out there with lots of fascinating and sometimes challenging and disturbing things happening. We never hear about it because the BBC broadcast elite have this incredibly parochial mindset. So we're not only fed a, a diet of mediocre adolescent opinions, but they're very myopic, short-sighted opinions. I think we could do so much better. Imagine in a few years' time, if an organization like Netflix was to do current affairs the way they do drama. It would be informative, insightful, compelling viewing. When was the last time the BBC current affairs program, programmers produced something that was genuinely insightful and informative? I, I genuinely can't think of any BBC current affairs program in the past decade or so that it has, has, has been interesting, insightful or informative. Well, you see, I wish I could comment on that, but I'm only 18. You see, <laughs> I, I look at the, I definitely see your point when you say um, about how can we justify the BBC in this age? See, I, I saw a, a paper where that said that the BBC were acting somewhat mafia-like by the way that they would use their privilege, as you said, to impose their values on, over many people. So I want to ask, um, the way they conduct themselves and considering that we are now living, living in a digital era, how can the BBC be justified? I mean, the BBC clearly can't be justified. It, it was created in the mid 20th century when people had a, a problem. People created the technology that allowed broadcasting so that the opinions of a few could be broadcast to millions. 
Now, the obvious problem when you're confronted with that problem in 1940, 1950 something, is how do you ensure that there's a plurality of opinion and a plurality of views? So the response in the mid 20th century was to create a, a state monopoly and to regulate it and to try to ensure that there was at least some balance in terms of forming opinion. But, you know, half a century on, we, we have the, the platforms to allow all sorts of views to be put forward. And yet we're lumbered with this state broadcaster that still believes that the answer to plurality is to have someone like uh, Emily Makeless uh, patronizingly condescend to us every evening. Now, I, I think that the BBC used the phrase mafia. I, I think it's a pretty good description of the BBC. They certainly imposed like a little gang, um, an un unaccountable gang, their values on the rest of us. Um, but I, I, I think you also see them behave like a mafia in terms of personnel. It, it has for many years apparently been impossible uh, to produce a topical current affairs talk show unless your name is Dimbleby. I'm not entirely sure why that was the case for many years. You, you, you see the same cliquey people often used to front the same shows. Um, and, and I think like a mafia, the, the commissioning process, who actually gets the big checks for producing things? This is all done in a very, I think, closed and, and, and uncompetitive way. Um, so I, I think we actually have to ask some profound questions about the way that the BBC operates and the way that it, it, it commissions. But I, I come to the view that it's not reformable. If you had asked me these questions five, even three years ago, I would have said maybe we needed to reform the BBC, maybe we needed to change the personnel at the top. I, I don't think these people can be reasoned with. They, they don't ultimately understand the problem. They, they can't see it because they're so marinated in their own groupthink. They're so absorbed in their own adolescent opinions. They genuinely can't see the extent to which they're being subjective. So I, I think the best thing we can do rather than trying to reform the BBC, is to give every person in the country a legal right not to pay, to turn, in effect, the BBC into a subscription service. And then if the BBC wants to patronise us, if it wants to promote um, aggressive street protest, if it wants to imply that somehow uh, aggressive street protest is um, somehow not aggressive and violent street protest, it, it, it's welcome to do so. Like a newspaper, it can take subjective opinions, but it can do it using its own revenue streams by appealing to its own subscriber base, not using my money. You see, one of the interesting things I've just picked up on what you just said is um, back when we talked about your comment about how much politics would be improved without the BBC commentary app, is, um, you used, let's be honest, de facto, you used your 2014 staggering by-election as an example that we don't need a BBC. You used social media and other ways to connect to your constituents and um, would you have said that this right there was the perfect example of showing politicians and in general the people of Britain that the BBC, if they continue to act the way they are, are unnecessary? Yeah, I mean, I wrote a book in 2014, two years before that by-election, called The End of Politics and the Birth of I Democracy. And I had a whole chapter talking about the way in which digital would allow the democratisation of opinion forming. And I argued that it would be like a, a, a reformation. We could create our own views and form our own opinions and overthrow the priesthood of pundits that um, preside over, over politics and policymaking. And this has happened far faster than I, I imagined would be possible. I mean, if I was setting out in politics today, if I was in my 20s looking to go into politics, I would think very carefully about ever appearing on the mainstream media. I would do interviews with people like Mayor Tuzi. I would talk to some of the key uh, bloggers, some of the key YouTubers. It, it's possible to talk directly to the public and to have a much more grown up conversation with the public, with the voters, without ever running the risk of, of going through the BBC. A few years ago, there was an eye-opening moment for me. I was watching, it wasn't the BBC, it was a, a different but equally state-supported um, broadcaster, Channel 4. Um, and they were interviewing a, a, a quite an interesting American, or Canadian actually, academic um, called Peterson. Um, and um, he had written a book 
and rather than asking him questions about the book and allowing him to say what he wanted to say, the interviewer, Kathy Newman, spent the entire time trying to patronize and trip him up and imply with this sort of almost juvenile line of questioning that he uh, adhered to opinions that, that he didn't. And for me, that, that was such an extraordinary moment. I realized then that broadcasters, I think, taking their cue from the BBC because it's so, so important, it, it tends to set the tempo and the tone of broadcasting in this country. I realized then that actually broadcasters were very often just dishonest. They're, they're activists with an agenda and they use the privileges they have from the license fee and the privileges they have um, through the system of, of state controlled broadcasting to basically tell us lies and deceive us. And I, I think that for many people was an watershed moment. I think it's now possible for, for politicians to do politics without going through these broadcasters at all. And I, I noticed that whenever Boris Johnson has something really important to say, he doesn't do what prime ministers would have once done, which is to ask the BBC to come in and ask him a few questions. He does a direct camera piece on social media. And you know what? Tens of millions of people listen to it. He says what people want to hear and people can take what he says at face value without being told what to make of it by a third rate mediocre BBC broadcaster. It's a nice idea, isn't it? This idea of let's have impartiality. Let's get the BBC back to what it's meant to do. The, the, the problem for me is that it, it's well beyond current affairs. When I look at the BBC's comedy output, there's nothing satirical about it. Their so-called satire shows are all the same soft left, cliched views promoted by really unfunny comedians. Real satire, the sort of thing that I see Maggie Foster making, um, would never get airtime on, on the BBC. I don't know if you know Maggie Foster. If you don't know her, follow her on social media. She's hilariously funny. She makes the sort of gentle satire programmes that the BBC ought to be making and the BBC used to make. Um, in terms of drama content, you know, the BBC produces the most patronising and condescending output. It's impossible to watch BBC drama because everything they do has to be a little lecture in political correctness. Whether it's Doctor Who or, you know, it, it's, it's tedious, it's just boring. Netflix, on the other hand, clearly looks at the numbers of their subscribers, looks at who watches what shows, and they produce stuff that is genuinely engaging and entertaining dramatic. The BBC can't be dramatic because it's pursuing a political agenda throughout its entire output. I, I'm not sure you can ever get the BBC back to some notion of good program making and impartiality. I, I think things are too far gone for that. I think you've got to let the BBC lose its privileges, face market pressure. It's ultimately, it's competition and choice that drives out bad ideas and allows good ideas in comedy and in, in current affairs and in much else to proliferate. So, you know, I, I'm afraid I, I think what we need to do is to encourage tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of people to refuse to pay for talentless, overpaid, overpromoted, cartel commissioning BBC producers from using their privileged position. A lot of them are pretty mediocre people at what they do. They do not deserve these legal privileges. And the sooner we all stop paying, the better. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think you really took the words out of my mouth uh, when you spoke about the, um, the personnel and, and specifically the presenters. I mean, I don't know if you know, but I think it was 1.75 million pounds was reported as the figure that was paid to Gary Lineker last year. And I find it completely bewildering that one man can earn all of this money off the backs of, say, low earning uh, individuals in this country who are faced with imprisonment if they don't go on to pay such fees. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm all in favour of Gary Lineker. I, I cheer every time I hear that someone has made a lot of money, honestly. When a football player like Gary Lineker is paid a lot of money, they deserve it because they've got a rare skill that lots of people want to watch and appreciate and good luck to you. If you can make millions, billions of pounds by giving people things that they want, I'm all in favour of it. What I deeply resent is somebody getting remunerated for a non-competitive process. I, I don't know specifically about the terms of Gary Lineker's contract, and it'd be unfair for me to, to talk about that, but I can think of a lot of BBC talent that is anything but talented. 
Um, yeah, so I'm going to leave you with one final question. Where do you see the BBC in 10 years' time? I think it will have largely stopped producing uh, entertainment and comedy. Some would say it stopped producing entertainment and comedy some time ago. Um, I, I think if they're nimble, they could perhaps salvage some current affairs, some public service broadcasting component. Unfortunately, rather like the Remainer elite, I suspect that the elite who preside over the BBC are, are, are fundamentally too stupid. I don't mean that as a term of abuse. I mean to describe a, a, an elite that behaves like the Habsburgs or the Romanovs. They're, they're too self-serving and slow to adapt to save themselves. I suspect that unless they're pretty quick to, to, to reform, I, I suspect that actually you'll get a mass non-payment and I think you could actually be instrumental in this. I, I think that your movement could be rather, you could be, you could be rather like Benjamin Franklin throwing off the yoke of George III oppression um, on the American colonists, and that gave rise to great things. I think you could be the revolutionary who sees us finally rid of this condescending cultural and broadcast elite. Just, just a final thought, if I may. Just take a look at the BBC and look at the strife that you see in Britain today with, with aggressive mobs tearing down statues, with protesters feeling that there's social injustice and so many uh, 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 cultural offences that they need to throw bicycles at police horses. Where is our public broadcaster in all of this? Why is it not creating a common narrative that binds us? Where is it when you need it? Where is it? When we need someone to promote a common history, a common narrative, a common sense of who we are, they are absolutely absent. That is the fundamental reason why we can do without the BBC. They failed where we absolutely needed the most. They are worse than useless. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time. We'll have to leave it there. Douglas Castle, everyone. <laughs>